Uh, my name is Mark Finn. Uh, I am uh, Robert E. Howard's latest, but by no means last biographer. Uh, just a scary thought to think. Um, and uh, I am very excited to be on this panel for a number of reasons. Uh, I would like to briefly uh, introduce the folks who are with us here for uh, the uh, the uh, boxing stories panel. Uh, starting at the far end of the table is Chris Gruber. Uh, Chris has written a number of uh, essays and introductions uh, concerning Robert e. Howard's boxing stories. Uh, he and I have worked together on a number of projects and uh, have been uh, co-collaborators and co-conspirators uh, for uh, as long as we've known each other, yeah, basically. <laughs> um, sitting next to Chris is our Howard Day's guest of honor. Our Howard Day's guest of honor, Patrice Lunet. I, I know, I, I, always with the critique of how well we get the pronunciation right. Uh, Patrice, as you know, uh, was the, is the gentleman who um, uh, uh, codifies and um, uh, assembles the Howard typescripts in, in chronological order. Uh, he's done editing on a, a, a wide range and huge number of books. He's written scholarly essays. Uh, he's, uh, he's done a lot of uh, important research that has changed how we see uh, the Howard uh, family. Uh, his work uh, cannot be understated uh, in Howard studies. And then sitting right next to me is our special artist guest, uh, a man who uh, also needs no introduction uh, and has been uh, uh, responsible for a number of uh, paintings um, for, uh, and book covers for the recent Howard uh, Foundation Press uh, books, Tom Gianni, uh, our panelist, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're, we're, we're changing up the format just a little bit uh, because uh, uh, at the end of this, uh, Tom is going to do the art presentation that uh, he had brought with him. And so uh, what, we're, what we'd like to do initially uh, for the start of this is sort of talk about the origin of the Boxing Stories project. And uh, we'll walk you very briefly through how it developed and what, uh, uh, in, in what order things happened in. And then uh, we'll take some questions, uh, if you guys have any, and then we'll turn it over to Tom for... Uh, for some elucidation. And I'm glad you're on the panel because I, I have some specific art questions I want to ask you. <laughs> no, they're, they're good questions. It's, it's not a grill session. It's just I'm, I'm, I'm always very curious about the process. So uh, actually, this and this project uh, starts with Patrice. Uh, so Patrice, would you like to, to join in on this? Let's see if this is it. Because I think it's the feedback from the quality. Is it good? Yeah. Uh, the actual project started around four or five years ago, something like that. But actually it began at uh, when I was starting to work on the time strip. And uh, uh, it was in the late 1920s when Howard became professional and started writing several drafts for his stories. And it turns out the first stories, in, in, in what were the cost against stories or five stories. And these are the first tales for which we have several drafts. So I, um, actually learned the data, how to date a Howard Tyfleet from the boxing stories. So I was starting uh, to understand when that story was written, that, uh, which was the first cast against story, whatever. And at the time, I was exchanging emails with Leo Green, uh, who was uh, an enthusiast of the boxing stories. So we were exchanging ideas back and forth, and, uh, and the years went by, and in uh, 2006, I got to talk with Chris over there at the World Fantasy Con, yes. and I think that the idea was pretty much born at that time that we should be doing something. And 2006 was the year when the foundation was uh, announced and created, the REH Foundation. And uh, I think about one or two years later, I told Chris that it would be great if we could do the complete boxing stories, and then and Chris told. Uh, we need to have Martin there because and I, uh, that would be great to have the three of us on this uh, boxing series. And we wanted this to be the ultimate, yes. definitive edition of the boxing stories. So it, it took us four years to, to achieve that. And 
I must say I'm very proud of what we did with those those books. Uh, Chris, uh, you want to jump in on where you uh, kind of joined the process? I'll tell you what. <clears throat> it, I think my voice will carry if not. Um, yeah. Uh, when, when I was contacted by uh, Patrice, when I was contacted by Patrice, it initially it was a discussion at the World Fantasy Convention in Austin. Um, we were we were really just talking about what we wanted to do with the text, how we wanted to approach the text, uh, I, and I insisted that they be treated uh, with care. <laughs> uh, I wanted them to be uh, considered in the same way uh, that Conan was. Not so much that I wanted people or demanded people um, accept them in the same way, but that they looked at it as a, a legitimate part of his creative professional output. and consider it when they worked on or read uh, Howard's work that they would look at the boxing stories first as a, as a, as a way to understand the author. Just another portion, that's all. Uh, and the way to do that, I, I told Patrice, was we really need to get everything. And Patrice, Patrice said, I already know that. We're going to get everything together. <laughs> he said, but we don't know what everything is yet, but I think I do. And that's where I really got on board. Uh, Patrice and I started emailing back and forth. And I said, there's one, one other person that really needs to be a part of, of this discussion. And, and the reason for it is uh, we've been laboring here in America, uh, and uh, that labor was getting fans to come out and learn about the boxing stories. And his name is Mark Finn. You know, he, I know Mark Finn, of course. He was, that's perfect. And then it's really, that's the kernel, the beginning of, of this, this whole process. And it did take a while. Uh, the, the ramping up process took a lot longer than the doing. Once we got going, uh, we, there were several things that happened along the way. Uh, one of them was uh, Glenn Laura's passing. We thought we had everything and we learned that, that we didn't. And it seemed almost as if every week would go by, I would learn there was something new to add. There was something new. Exciting. It was very exciting, it, it, also sad. It was, a, it was a roller coaster of emotion. I was very fond of, of Glenn and, and, and I thought of Glenn as a, uh, the, the caretaker, you know. <laughs> he was the man that, that had everything and, and he, if without him, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have this discussion. So that's where I come in, um, basically because Patrice called, said, "Hey, Chris, let's do this." I said, "Mark, let's do this," and off we went. Now, of course, um, I had been a oh, Lord love a duck. All right, <laughs> I had been a, uh, interested in the boxing stories as a fan for years. Uh, when I first met Rusty Bark in cross planes about <laughs> years ago uh, I said to him you're Rusty Burke you're the guy editing the boxing stories for Necronomicon Press <laughs> that's how I knew Rusty as he was the boxing editor uh, on Robert E. Howard's fight stories uh, and uh, and he said yeah and I said are, are, when are we going to see number five and he said I'm working on it <laughs> and so uh, for, and so uh I've been harping on people to get this stuff out uh, for years. Chris and I and Leo used to have very involved discussions. What would a complete set look like? How would this do? What would we, what would we include? What format? Would what we format get? would we use? How would we bring this out? So um, I think one of the reasons why it came together as well as it did is because, uh, you know, when, when Patrice does what he does, it suggests a certain order. Uh, in the case of the Conan books, you know, for example, um, you know, anytime something isn't quite in order, Patrice answers it in his essays. But uh, with a lot of the things, you know, running it in chronological order, it's just going to break along certain lines. The boxing stories didn't quite do that. Uh, and it's because they run for such a long period of time and they run in and out of so many other things, we had to talk about structure, but you know, Chris and I had already been having these conversations for literally years. So, I, so it really, was just kind of a matter of going. I think this. I think this too. Okay, yeah, let's do that. I mean, it was really, you know, uh, which was nice. And and um, the the stuff that Chris uh, talks about, Glenn Lord's passing, uh, Patrice's baby. Uh, there there were these there were obstacles. There were hurdles that got in the way of it. But there but once we got to where we actually had workable texts and started working on the stuff in earnest. 
it came together really fast. And uh, uh, I remember there, there was a certain amount of excitement. And I literally, I got, to, I, whenever the new thing came in, I dropped everything. Whatever I was working on, I did, I, let's, let's do this. Let's knock it out. Um, I know, because what Chris and I had done, and, and, and it, I don't want this to sound like vanity or hubris, but we really kind of created a demand. And I want to apologize to all of you who didn't know you were Boxing Stories fans until you came and talked to us. But we, but we really we created a demand for the books and the stories that wasn't there previously. And so we were, we were just as anxious to see it come out. We, for us, this is, this is fan stuff for us. You know, and we would, every time Patrice would go, hey, new batch, should we include it? And Chris and I would go, yeah, yeah. yes, Rubber yes, stamp. include it. <laughs> yes, you include it. Of course we include it. So, um, so that's what's really cool about this. And it is a bittersweet project because this was the first, um, there have there, been other projects that, that, that obviously use Glenn Lord's papers, but this is the first time all the boxing stuff has come together uh, complete. And there was stuff that we didn't, that we hadn't seen, that we were looking at for the first time that was really exciting. So um, essentially once all this was done, we talked about essays and things of that nature. And uh, Chris and I decided that what we wanted to do was make, we wanted this to be, since this was going to be the four volume set, for a lot of you, this was going to be the first time you've read these stories. We needed to make sure that the introductions had, had every erg fraction of contextual material necessary for you guys to understand why this was so important. And I think we really, I think we hit it out of the park with those. Because, uh, because again, we, he and I have had 10 years, 15 years talking back and forth to, to work it out. We, we also had the opportunity, we also had the opportunity, I wanted to jump in there. Uh, I knew going in that we each brought a different aspect of interest in these stories. Um, we leaned on Patrice here significantly. I, I, I didn't have to worry in my introduction about talking style or, or looking at when this was published or when that was published or what he was working on when, uh, aside from the boxing stories. Uh, often he would write a boxing story very quickly while he was working on another more, as it turned out, more popular uh, work in fantasy or, or, or a western or whatever it may be. Was, I didn't have to worry about that. It, we had a three-pronged approach. I was going to look at the history. I was going to tell you why it was significant, why it was important, where he was getting, where he was getting his uh, cultural cues from. Mark was going to look at it from a different point of view. Let me explain how this all is, is working together why it was important and he is going to show how it was done I mean literally digging deep into things that was had to be different in fact I'd like you to tell them just how difficult it was working with the boxing text and you can start if you would with crowd horror and Iron Man oh. uh, that is a piece of work So as, as I was saying, in the late 1920s, uh, Bob Harrow was starting to become a real professional, so he would start writing several drafts of a story. Problem is, he would not number his pages, and he, there was no way we could tell which page belonged to what draft or whatever, and all those pages had been scattered all over the place. So every time I would get a batch of five, ten pages, they could belong to one story or another, or sometimes different drafts, or sometimes one story, and part of that story may have been reworked into another story. Mm -hmm. And Crab Horror, and Crab Horror is a story that he wrote in 1929. He sold it, but the editor said, oh, it's far too long. You need to get that. <coughs> so that's what he did. And so about 15 pages worth of text were kept from the story. He sent the new version, and this was the version that got published. Problem is, what did he do with the, the, the remaining 15 pages? Well, he wrote a new story using those pages. And so you had to understand, oh, this, oh these are pages that come from the earlier draft. They have been re, uh, reworked, uh, renumbered, and they are going to be included in the new version of that new tale. I mean, it, and of course, you get the pages one at a time. So sometimes over several months or even years. So it took years, I mean, to, to understand the exact writing chronology of all those tales. I mean, it was, I mean, I started doing that 
maybe in 2000, 2001. Yeah. So that was a real long time ago. And that book, the first volume, uh, was complete or completed, I mean, I think 15 times. Yeah. Because, okay, this is, this is it. We have everything. Oh, no, oh, wait, no. here is a new batch. <laughs> okay, I need, I need one more week so we can you know, see if the pages are where they are going and if we're going to include those. Where and, anyway, yeah. and where to include them and uh, uh, I remember discovering pages and send that to Chris and so do you, do you think we should use that oh yeah okay where do where, where do we put them yes. I don't know I mean it was like that all the time so it yes it was a long project it was hard but I think in the end we did the what we had to do absolutely yeah I um, I want to I want to uh, turn now to the uh, to the final phase of the project, but but you know it's interesting because uh, you came last to the work, and yet you're the first thing everybody sees. Uh, and so, uh, uh, if you would please uh, talk about how uh, how you came to be involved with the books uh, and, and what that process is, I'm probably going to step on your the, your presentation a little bit, but but in the, but. Uh, you know, I, I know you, uh, you work with Jim Keegan, uh, and so uh, if you could please just kind of let us know uh, about about how you uh, made some of the choices that you made. All right. Um, yeah, Jim contacted me about this this series of books, and uh, I was thrilled. I mean, um, it's fun. It's really a labor of love doing these paintings. I'll, I'll tell you that right now. Um, yeah, the process is that I, I generally, um, you know, I, I look through the book and I get a flavor for it, and then I uh, do a lot of sketches and I do uh, visual research, and um, I do uh, the sketches. I do. I run them past um, the art director, which in this case was Jim, and he's a great art director. I love working with art directors who are artists because they understand <laughs> the visual language. Um, and uh, in researching uh, this, I, I went to uh, boxing films of the 40s and early 50s. Mm -hmm. And two of them that are a big influence uh, was uh, Kirk Douglas's Champion. Yeah. That's the biggest influence. And also uh, Robert Ryan in The Setup. Uh, two great film noir boxing films. And, and um, so I... I got my inspiration, visual inspiration, from those films. Um, and then uh, I painted it. <laughs> <laughs> Did that quite well. Nice. Um, but I've always been enthralled by uh, pulp art uh, since I was a little kid, since I read Jim Steranko's History of the Comics, and The Shadow was my first love. But the, the art in the, the pulps has always uh, intrigued me, so I think, you know, that had a, a big effect on me. So, of course, I look at my heroes when I paint, and that would be uh, Baumhofer, yeah. and Rosen, and Ward, and uh, I could go on about the painters there. Well, that was, that was actually, that was something I wanted to ask you. Uh, uh, when we saw the cover for Volume 2, my first thought was... That um, you were doing uh, uh, not an homage, but almost a continuation or, or an interpretation of Baumhofer's Sailor and Monkey uh, oh, no, no, no. things, which I which to, I love personally. I think those are uh, some of my favorite covers of his, and I, I love the fact that on, on that this brief period in adventure, they're they're not even connected to stories; they were just flavor uh, pieces. But uh, but they tell a story, and I I, re I really like the fact that you it it seemed that you were doing a nod. Was that was that intentional? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a story about that. Somebody asked um, John Ford how he how he filmed the stagecoach, and he said with a camera. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. And and I mean that's basically people ask me how do you paint this stuff. I said I, I just down and paint it, you know. And, yeah. But it does take a, a, a process, and I do look at other artists for inspiration. For the pirate painting, it was N.C. Wyeth and um, Howard Pyle. Yeah. Um, and and uh, yes, that was influenced by Baumhofer greatly. Very cool. Yeah. Patrice. Yes. 
I don't think we ever mentioned this before, but uh, the vol- the series you know as Fist of Iron was add, add another title initially, yeah. and our title was believe it or not Tales from the Ice uh, Tales sorry Tales from the Ice House the Collective Boxing Stories of Robert Howard Volume One, and so they quite long title title, <laughs> and the day we got the the painting the cover art for the Volume One okay this is beautiful we need to find a shorter title yes <laughs> so the shortest one you know and so <laughs> it became Face of Iron yes yeah. that's right. Um, actually, s- starting at the uh, starting at the end with Chris here, uh, uh, if you would please kind of just briefly talk about like what your what was your favorite part of working on this project, aside from the fact that we're finally getting it done. What was your favorite part? Okay. Uh, aside from actually getting it done, there were an, I got to work with with texts. Um, I had a feel for the stories for a long time and I knew there was things of missing I just knew there were missing pieces uh, that would connect my feelings with the text uh, I would talk about these stories with with fans and, and, and people who enjoyed the stories as much as I did but it was all conjecture I, I didn't have an opportunity to definitively say that, you know this is the way it is um, now we do there's so much that we found Working when we did this project, working with these texts allowed me to make that that missing that link. You know, we link it together and finally go. Oh, the thing I felt about these stories is true, and now I can look at this new piece of material handily available in one of four volumes. It looks so beautiful on my shelf. I can point to it, and now it's a part of lore. It's a, it's, it's the history now. It's not just me asserting what my feelings are or how I feel. I can say, well with definitive authority, because that's what this, this is, I can say, look at page X, there it is, there's the answer. And finally, these stories have the same uh, respect that the other portions of Howard's writing have enjoyed for so long. So I would say that was probably my uh, greatest thrill, was working with these new texts and, and finally making that connection that I always knew existed. Yeah. And, and afterwards, I'll, I'll tell anyone that wants to know what I'm talking about, I can give you specific examples, you know, page by page of what's new and why I think it's important. So, Patrice, well, I've always enjoyed working on old type scripts, uh, and uh, I mean, putting it back all together was for me the greatest thrill, I suppose, and uh, and working with you guys because uh, I'm not a boxing fan. I have never seen a boxing match in my life, and and so. I needed those guys' perspective because um, they showed me things that I would never have realized by myself. Because you can see the stories from my perspective, you know, the the scholar thing, but they saw it from boxing, a boxing fan perspective, and so this gave me an entirely new angle on them and a new ways to appreciate them. Because I think you can appreciate the stories on different levels, and so some of them, most of them, are funny, and some are serious and. You can see that he had things to say uh, on boxing, on, on humans, on people. And this is what I found in the books. Very good. Um, I, th- you're going to be doing two more of these. Yes. Uh, I, I, I kind of want to know. I mean, one of the things that I floated to Jim early on was it'd be really cool if there was a spine design that when you put them together on a shelf made a picture. Mm. Um, I don't even, I don't know if he passed that along to you or not, mm. but I, yeah, that's because Jim knows better. <laughs> <laughs> but um, working on the four, you know, were, were you thinking of it in terms of a series uh, or were you thinking of it in terms of uh, uh, kind of capturing what's in each book? What was the, the impetus for that? And, and, and in terms of this, uh, you know, would you would you want to do more boxing art in this vein? Um, I'm kind of kind of like Patrice. I, I'm not really a boxing fan, but uh, reading the stories were a, a real hoot. Um, and um, I, I would love to do more. Um, the the next two ones coming up, they're you know most pulp covers have nothing to do with the content. <laughs> And um, I, I uh, they're, they're kind of, uh, how shall I put it, they're just more uh, representational of the whole feel of the yeah. 
stories. Uh, I mean, I, for the uh, second uh, round two, I started to get kind of, um, started really telling a story. I got, it was getting kind of complicated and Jim pulled me back. And he said, let's, let's simplify this a little bit. Less is more. And I'm glad he did that. Um, again, that's working with somebody who is visually trained. So uh, the next two, uh, I guess you could say, are, are just my feeling for the, the, the pulp uh, and the boxing as a whole. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, for me, the, the biggest thrill was um, I, it's, it was giving these stories the scholarly treatment that I knew they needed. Um, Groob and I have written several essays in different places uh, detailing different aspects of, of the stories and uh, uh, there was something that uh, was very rewarding about kind of taking all of this material that I had researched and referenced over the years and distilling it down into almost a uh, not, not a punch list but 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 you know uh, let, let's tick it off let's let's recap <laughs> you know this is 15 years of uh, of the ice house panel uh, panels this is uh, this is 12 years of mine and groups private discussions that where we would literally drain the batteries on our phones just yep. talking this stuff out back and forth it's it, it's it's uh, countless uh, email conversations and and just being able to kind of distill it and crystallize it down and make it something that you can read and go, he's right. I hadn't thought of that before, you know. And, and so that was the, that for me was the, was the most rewarding thing. I knew the stories were good. Yeah, it wasn't the issue. Um, but um, there, there are definitely people who are going to read these books because it's a Robert E. Howard story, not because they're boxing fans. So it, I think it was important for us to give you a context as to why why we've spent so much time on this, and so uh, that that for me really was the was the icing on the on the cake. There, there were times there were times uh, we would talk, like he said, burning the midnight oil about these stories, and we never felt fatigued by it. Uh, we, every 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 conversation we had was. You, you you mentioned earlier how you remember how we were talking about having uh, boxing gloves as on the spines. Yeah. So each each we would throw these ideas around like uh, baseball cards for a kid. I mean we we're just it was it was such fun to work with it because we had already loved the stories. But it was it's been even more fun having the opportunity right now for me to hold the books up, show you guys, share them, and say see. See, this, we, we finally have it. Because I adore, I adore these stories. Uh, not all of them are great. Uh, I, I just, I adore what inspired them. I understand them, and I want to share that so much. Um, I love all aspects of Robert E. Howard, but the, the nights that we spent talking about these things, I used to talk with Leo about these, Leo Grin. I used to talk with Leo Grin about these things. These were, it's a very uh, powerful set of stories for us. Um, but more than that, now we have something that we can hold. It's just yeah. really fun, and, and that whole process. That's why you know we're up here in front of y'all, is because we were able to share that. I I'm, I asked Patrice today, how did you feel when you had that first volume in your hand? And he goes, out of this world. This was great. This is this is finally the pinnacle, and this is one of the last um, one of the last elements of Howard's writing uh, to to get this kind of treatment. So uh, enjoy it because yeah. they're there to be enjoyed. We're gonna we're gonna open it up for questions. If anybody's got one, uh, Ed. This is for Chris. Um, how did you approach this project um, versus the Nebraska boxing stories? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, Rusty Burke is the one that approached me to to do that volume. I had never done anything like that, so there was a steep learning curve. Uh, there was many things I had never done before. So there, I was also trying to create a, a best of. So I had to pick stories. I didn't want to just do all Costigans. I wanted to get significant stories that had something to say be, beyond just being entertaining. I, again, I, I, I've always been angling for respect for the stories because there's, there's a lot of complexity to, to what drives the story. Uh, so I, ch I had to choose a, like a best of, and, I, and, and that's a lot different than this. This was right from the beginning, everything 
They're the, definitive. It's done. You, know, you now have everything you want to have with regard to boxing. Uh, and you also have the Costigans, also never done before, uh, in one place. One place. So you don't have to go to some five and dime bookstore and, and, and cobble together some Dorgan stories to get your real Costigans com, uh, collection complete. No, you don't have to do that. Now you have the full rhyme. So the big, biggest difference is that I knew what I wanted to do. Right, I, I knew the roadmap was clear yeah. with this project versus the bison. The bison was the first step that was the, I, I viewed it as the gateway to the story. So once people start reading these particular stories that I chose, I knew they'd be back for more. And as it was the case, they, they were. We had people coming up asking me, well, did he write more? Yes, yeah, perfect. The yeah. Vine did what it was supposed to do. And now you have what your appetite. Let's move on. Let's get the whole <laughs> kitten caboodle out there for everybody. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, as someone who's never read a Robert E. Howard boxing story, what is, I guess, for you fellas, in the end, what is it about these stories that you love uh, so much? Uh, very simply, for me, um, I don't think you can have a complete picture of Robert E. Howard without taking the boxing stories into account. If you're basing your feelings about Howard and his life on the 20-odd Conan stories that you've read, you're looking at one-tenth of his creative output. And so um, what's significant about the boxing stories is that they were almost all humorous. They were funny in nature. And they led directly into the funny westerns, the Brecker and Jelkin stories. Um, and his humor writing is approximately one third of his output. That changes things quite a bit. And so I think that because they're humorous, the way they're written, um, you, you get a very different, more, more nuanced picture of Howard as a writer. And I think they are, um, not as polarizing as the Conan stories. So when you're trying to bring somebody into Howard, uh, it can, it, the humor stories can be a great way to, to open that door, um, I, you know, because Conan can sometimes turn people off, you know? Uh, but yeah, and, and so for me, the, the, I think that's a, a great foot forward and um, it's uh, uh, the passion that Howard has in his other stories, he's just as present in the boxing stories, but in a different way. So when you find out, when you get the connections to his biography and uh, like what he liked about boxing, and realize that he wrote boxing stories for all of his professional career, um, I, I think you have to give those some some consideration. So if you're if you're seriously looking at more Howard, uh, the sooner you get to some boxing stories, I, I think the better. Chris, you want to add sure. anything to that? Yeah. Uh, Again, your question is a, a topic that we've had conversations, it's specifically that question, uh, why do you love me so much? Uh, I'm a boxing fan. Uh, I love the sport. I, 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 it's, very, it's more than just cathartic for me, but it is, a, it is a part of who I was growing up. It's a part, the sport itself uh, speaks to me on, on a human level. Uh, because it's you in the ring, uh, Howard, Howard, most of his characters are, are, are loners, so we talked about this before. Um, he, he revels in those kind of things. So I like the sport, and you're one step closer to understanding Robert E. Howard, the man, because of this. Also, too, um, I, I love American authors, uh, because I'm American, but I, I like to look at the progression of who I think is great versus the masses. You know, I'm a huge Jack London fan. Uh, there's a lot... Howard was, in my estimation, the boxing stories show him to be the quintessential American author. There's a lot of driving forces culturally, economically, uh, that are reflected in the boxing stories. They're also modern. So uh, you're, you're, you're reading fiction from your favorite author who's created Conan and all these wonderful, fantastic uh, people from at least a few hundred years ago for his historicals all the way to new old epochs in, in ancient history but here you've got a set of uh, a large volume of, of output that's modern and, and, it, and it it speaks 
to everyone reading it at that time. Fight Stories was a fin was really popular. Boxing was huge at the time. And when, when people start to realize the cultural context in which they were created, it draws him further and further to the center of American, or well, Americana. He's really an American author, and he sets himself apart from other authors, like Lovecraft, for instance, who is obviously American, but uh, you take his work and you hand it to your average show out there, yeah, I got. I'm too busy for that. Yeah. But you put a boxing in front of somebody in 1929, a boxing story. You're going to get instant interest. There's a connection between the person, and you. It could be a, a Wall Street tycoon or a guy in the gutter. Everyone knew boxing, and that's why I like it. <laughs> um, I saw your hand go first. Yes, sir. Um, of course, the other sport in probably Howard's youngest formative years, the other combat sport that was huge and gave boxing, and, you know, right up there with boxing, was catch as catch can wrestling years, Gotch, oh. Hack, and Schmidt, so on. Can you speak to anything in any of Howard's stories or in his own personal letters and things about uh, his relationship with that? Sure. Would you answer? Um, well, yeah, Howard wrestled as a, as a kid. Uh, that was a that was a sport that they that they did. Uh, just roughhousing. Um, he did. Um, he he used wrestling in the boxing stories. Uh, one of the unfinished stories that looks like it might have been a false start uh, for Costigan uh, had a wrestler in it, and uh, wrestling shows up in um, uh, in, in other forms. In um, kind of, it, it's sort of like a. There's a few other sports that he mentions, uh, savat, jiu-jitsu, uh, pretty interesting stuff considering this is literally 1929 and 1930 when this is stuff, when this is being written. And so uh, I think he was aware of it, um, but I don't think it, ha it, it, it wasn't as interesting to him as, as boxing because there was a, you know, that was the combination of skill and strength. Uh, and uh, Well, speak to... Volume in volume one, there's the right hook. No, in in, in volume one in the appendices, there's a he, he, Howard had published this thing called the right hook. It's a personal, uh, almost like a almost like a zine, uh, apazine. And it, in it, one of the titles uh, is called Money, 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 and he talks about this uh, wrestler ad nauseum in, in disparaging terms. When I might add, yeah. Uh, not because he dis was disparaging wrestling. Um, he was getting sick of the. Some wrestlers took it seriously to catch this can. Uh, some, the seeds of what we know wrestling today were born at that time, and he was not happy with the fakeness that was being. And so, and he pointed out money, 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 and then he he wrote an article, and then he followed it up in the next issue, talking about this guy, money, this uh, champion wrestler who who did not earn his title, and he was really upset about it. He's like, this this sucks. <laughs> and, and so to answer your question, yeah, he was aware of it, and he enjoyed it, uh, certainly not like boxing, but it, enough that he promoted it in his own little, little circular that he passed out to his friends, and then you know, wrote about it as well. Uh, in uh, Blue River Blues okay, is what you were referring to with yeah. regard to the, to the <laughs> what was his name? You guys got to read this, because the way he describes the 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 wrestler, the way he thinks, the brow furrowing and the, the slow grasping, <laughs> it's very humorous. Yeah. Uh, once again, very funny. We have time for one more question before I turn it over to, to Tom for the art presentation. All the way in the back. And any of you can answer this question of the works that Howard has put out there. With these stories in mind, are they right for literary criticism? Yes. Uh, I think more so than some of his fantasy work, because while the fantasy work uh, contains some elements which may be polarizing uh, to uh, a, a lay audience and certainly an academic audience, uh, you know the the inclusion of some of the now discredited historical theories can potentially distract from. A cracking good story. The boxing stuff, which is written in a hu using humor, all of this stuff becomes caricature. It becomes a satire. It becomes a burlesque. And so, uh, a you forgive more, but b 
you, you start tapping into some very elemental themes. Uh, masculinity, men's studies, um, American culture, um, uh, atavism, uh, the uh, relationship between uh, the haves and the have-nots. Um, like any like any group of Howard stories, at there's there's always some clunkers. There's always some duds. Whether it's Veil of the Lost Women or uh, Sailor's Grudge. Okay. All right. Um, but when Howard is at is good, when he's at his best, I'll take the Pepsi Challenge with anything you want to throw me from. You know Hemingway or Steinbeck or, or whatever, and in this case, when Howard's at his best writing boxing stories, he deserves to be included in the perennial uh, literary boxing collections that come around every two to five years. That always includes a piece of steak. Uh, it always includes um, Crocs uh, Master. Uh, yeah, Crocs the Master, uh, Battle the Le- Legend of Battling uh, Bilson. Um, the Mexican, uh, all of the, there, there's really only like a handful, uh, 12 to maybe London, 20. Yeah, London, AC, Whitworth, those guys. Yeah, these guys, and, and, and if you if you throw it open to include um, P.G. Woodhouse, uh, Ring Lardner, you, you know, it's the same anthology every time, and, and Howard is always missing from that. And the reason why he's missing is because these stories have been buried behind Conan's shadow for, for 40 years. And now that they're coming out, from around Conan Shadow, when you see people list the the Howard heroes at the beginning of an article talking about Robert E. Howard as a writer, you now always see among the Conan and the Cull and the Solomon Kane and the Brand McMorn and sometimes Red Sonia, you will always see either Costigan, Breckenridge Elkins, or both. That is a sea change that has happened in the last 15 years. <laughs> And, uh, and it's significant because now this stuff can be looked at uh, critically. And I, and I think you're going to find that, that, that the themes that Howard was writing about in Conan and Colin Solomon Kane are present in the boxing stories as well. And so I think in some ways it's going to be easier academically to get your hands on that. And I only want to add one thing. The, the whole idea of the Iron Man, of the, of the Iron Man, is just ready it's ripe for academic criticism it's it's ripe for analysis it um all the themes that he's talking about uh really center themselves on on the idea that certain certain humans had like almost like a piltdown man syndrome uh, where an some, evolutionary throwback and, and atavism <laughs> yeah. and, and I, I, so yes um the the idea of the iron man itself was born of his of sciences at the time is misappropriation of, of 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 the truth regarding humanity. Now we have DNA. Now we have genetics to that disproved all of the evolutionary theories at the time. So Howard was dabbling, dancing around what was at that time accepted science uh, with regard to certain certain people being superior, certain people being inferior, certain types of people having thicker skulls, and, and that's why they they do the things they do. And, uh, the brain is smaller. These things, his his evolutionary Iron Man, excuse me, his Iron Man is is like a an evolutionary textbook of what he thought modern men were emerging into, yeah. or or fighting the atavistic as, aspect of mankind's civilizing influence. Uh, every once in a while, spitting out one of these quote unquote uh, uh, Cro Magnon type, because that's the word he used, Cro Magnon type. People, so there's a, a whole slew of opportunity to examine Howard, examine the time that created Howard, <laughs> and where where he lived, what he did. So yes, to answer your question directly, there's it's more than ready. Yeah. Um, I, I, if if you guys have some more questions, certainly I want you to track us down at the barbecue. Uh, we'll we're, obviously Chris and I will talk about this all night. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> what I'd really like to do now with the remaining time, and, and we're a little over, uh, but I, I, I don't want Tom to be rushed. I want to turn it over to Tom's uh, uh, art presentation because I've been it's looking. Kind of short, anyway. 
Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, it, it, it's a quality, not a quantity thing, sir. Okay. <laughs> so um, let's uh, let's take a look at what uh, what Tom uh, brought us to, to take a look at, and uh, we'll uh, we'll be happy to uh, to chat more about this at, at the end of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the, of the evening. Okay, you, you might want to give me a few minutes just to make sure I get this all. Set well, up. while he takes a few minutes, I want to say one thing uh, to, to both Patrice and Mark. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. This is the pinnacle of my Howard, uh, my Howard fandom. This is uh, thank you for including me. Yeah. Uh, and I think you all owe a big round of applause and thanks to uh, Patrice for kicking this off and actually and doing finishing the, it. The, the hard work. Yeah. Bottom of my heart, thank you. <coughs> thank you to you. It's been a ride and I loved it. All right. 